In this episode, I talk with Commander Mike Bing Crosby as we talk about prostate cancer and leading through prostate cancer. Welcome aboard. This is the Admiral's Almanac, your leadership life connection, bringing leaders from all walks of life into yours so you can take charge, improve your leadership, and improve your life. With the wit and wisdom of your host, Rear Admiral Gary Hall. And thank you. It's November, or some people call it Movember, where we focus on men's health issues. Today, we're going to focus primarily on prostate cancer with an interview with Commander Mike Bing Crosby. So let's take it away and talk to Mike. Okay, and welcome back to the Admiral's Almanac. I'm in our downtown studio with Mike Crosby, call sign Bing. I'm your host, uh, Gary Hall, call sign Viper. Uh, Mike is a Naval Academy graduate, class of 1983, and a fighter pilot. I'm from the class of 1976, a helo pilot. So how did we meet? How did we meet, Mike? We both have been diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. And so I think uh, and you've been a great leader uh, in the fight for prostate cancer. And with it being Movember with Men's Health Awareness, I thought this would be a great uh, um, podcast. So Mike and I will share our journeys and how Mike has been a leader in raising awareness on prostate cancer in vets. And so remember, this is not medical advice, but two uh, Navy guys giving you insight um, into our journeys so that men will make uh, better deser- decisions. So, um, Mike, I think uh, I met you because I had been diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer and looking at what uh, um, procedures to go with. And we got our Naval Academy um, newsletter, Wave Tops. And for some reason, I opened it up and it said, fighter pilot attacks cancer with precision. And I said, I bet you that guy's got prostate cancer. And of course, it was uh, um, Mike Crosby. And the topic was cyber knife. And there we go. So why don't you tell us? Mike, first of all, welcome. Why don't you tell us about your journey from, uh, you know, just a regular guy, and next thing you know, you've got prostate cancer. Yeah, thanks, Viper. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, it was uh, one of those things where uh, I had always, I think like all of us, maybe aviators, uh, do it more regularly than others. I'll, I'll brag about us a little bit, but uh, we always had to do an annual flight physical. And uh, when I left uh, active duty, I always kept up that uh sort of just was in the in the schedule right I and mean, not not a lot of as i found out not a lot of men do that uh if their wives don't schedule it for them and i don't know there's a lot of discussion about whether that's ego or you don't want to know or it's just avoidance or uh whatever but I, I we do try to to tell people nowadays that just go see the doc once a year just put it on your business schedule and go once a year takes a couple of hours, get your blood drawn, figure out what's in there. That's all this is. It's Absolutely. not that hard. But I had, uh, so in uh, 2015, uh, 14, actually, I had been at, I'd moved all of my uh, stuff to um, Phoenix VA. And if everybody remembers the uh, the press and what was going on at the Phoenix VA with the scheduling scandal and uh, delays and whatnot, uh, I had, had had my, I'd forced them because I, I had to ask them to put the PSA screening on my uh, panel. I had a, uh, a family member um, through marriage that had dealt with prostate cancer. So I was aware of the PSA screening and scanning and that are just the blood levels. So I'd always ask them to do, do such. And uh, what had happened is in 14, uh, I was working overseas selling airplanes and I'd come back from my physical when I, and I left without getting all the results. So half my fault, half theirs, but I called in for the results and they said, Oh, you're fine. Take your statin and you're, you'll be good. Right. Yeah. And, uh, um, and I didn't go through the details. I didn't get a paper copy. And then I go in the next year uh, for my physical and my PSA is at uh, somewhere around 13.5, 14.5. Wow. Wow. So, so tell, tell us, uh, what a normal PSA should be, what men should be concerned with. Yeah, it's a, uh, okay. So PSA, uh, for those of you that uh, haven't heard this, it's a, a prostate specific antigen and that's a simple blood test. It's in, it's in any of your normal blood tests. They can, you know, it's a 
not even a vial. They just take a spot of it and and do the test. That test will come back uh, with a level somewhere between zero and whatever number. But it they, they used to say that it was zero to four was sort of the normal range. And above four, you would be recommended to go to a urologist and discuss a biopsy. Um, I will say today, though, that that, that trend is, is changing a little bit in that um, it's more important to look at the rate of rise, not so much always the just the, the, the static number, because you could have a PSA of one and have it go to, to three uh, in a year, and it would look like a hockey stick. Uh, and that's that's a, a bit of a, a concern. There's also people don't quite realize it that uh, there's about four ways that your PSA can can rise or be elevated. One is through an infection or BPH type of a thing, which they can take care of with antibiotics. There's uh, the uh, you know strenuous exercise, a lot of bike riding before you go in for your test is going to uh, increase your uh, your PSA. Uh, if you have sex before 48 hours before you go in, you're going to have a residual high PSA. Uh, or uh, if you've got cancer, or it's not going to prove that you have cancer, but that's cancer does uh, excrete a higher PSA level. And that's one of the indicators. It's not the perfect. It's not a perfect test. They're trying to develop other tests right now uh, to get to that point. And we try to encourage the research at that area because um, that leads us to the point that this disease is curable uh, if it's found at the low to intermediate state. If it hasn't left, if it hasn't metastasized and left the prostate, uh, you have a about a 99.9% chance of curing your prostate cancer. Yeah, if it yeah. gets out, you know, if it gets out, that, that percentage goes down to about 30%. Yeah. And uh, big deal. Yeah, I was going to say uh, U.S. News and World Report uh, studied cancer, curable cancers from 1970s to current, and prost- the curable rate for prostate cancer is number one, the most curable. So uh, one point that you made that I think we want to highlight is you said, you've always said, please check my PSA when taking uh, blood samples. And a lot of times you go to a clinic and that might not be on the um, script. So, you know, it's worth men need to ask, are you screening for my PSA? And if not, uh, um, please do. And the other thing you mentioned was, you know, the rate of rise. And that's how I wound up in uh, the prostate uh, clinic was uh, my doctor, you know, again, as aviators doing that annual physical. And he looked at the rate of rise over a period of several years. And I was just uh, at four, but the rate of rise is what sent me right to the prostate uh, um, clinic in the head doctor there at Walter Reed said, I'm spring loaded to the biopsy um, position. So I, next thing you know, I'm in the biopsy position. So, uh, <laughs> which, which we can get, we can get to, but uh, yeah, yeah, being right, the most right. uh, curable uh, cancer, I think, you know, as I was talking with you earlier, that maybe the reason that men die is, uh, I think it's fear and uh, embarrassment. Um, fear of learning that they might have something or embarrassment or they don't want to talk about anything between, as I said, between the thigh bone and the belly button. And a lot of men are concerned about, uh, um, you know, how do you get examined in those uh, areas? Well, so I wound up going to um, getting referred from my doctor. He didn't even do, uh, and we're going to use the term DRE. He said, I'm going to send you right to uh, um, the prostate uh, clinic. And for those of you that don't know what a, a DRE is, that's a digital rectal exam. And uh, do not fear it. You know, it's uh, it's over in a second. Anyway, um, so I had my biopsy taken and uh, it came back where uh, two or three of the samples of 12 samples had cancer in it. And I, I then went and my doctor said, don't worry, this is life changing, not life uh, threatening. Um, And I had to ask the question, do I have uh, prostate cancer? And the answer was, yes, you have um, prostate cancer. Now, the one thing they do at Walter Reed is um, they uh, have what I call the prostate fair, where um, six men and their spouses show up on a Monday and they spend all day talking about uh, um, the options uh, for care. And what is interesting is why you need to have your spouse involved is uh, again, you, we all then were separated into different rooms and the doctors rotated around. 
And uh, when the um, radiation uh, folks came and met with me, uh, one, um, they wanted to talk about what I was doing on the National Security Council for 20 minutes before they talked about my uh, prostate. <laughs> and then my wife said something. When the surgeons come in here, I want to talk about cyber knife. She had somehow heard that, and uh, that's when the doctor said it's it's neither cyber nor a knife, it's uh, radiation. And so uh, when I was presented with all the options, I decided to, you know, sleep on it and think on it. And that's when I saw you um, in wave tops, uh, yeah. a fighter pilot approaches cancer with uh, precision. And I said, I wonder if that's cyber knife. And uh, sure enough, it was. How about tell me what the statistics are? of men getting cancer the um yeah right now in in society we're at about uh of our whole united states population one in nine men will uh will, get, will have prostate cancer in their life uh african americans are about uh, one in seven but the um uh, and veterans we're seeing are somewhere below that one in seven. We're probably in the neighborhood of uh, one in six to one in five. And the um, we don't know why the, there hasn't been a study. We know that African Americans and and uh, anybody else that has it in their family, it's a hereditary uh, component to it, and so that has a much higher propensity if you've had it in your family that you're going to get it. Um, it's we're starting to see a bit of a younger component to this. We're seeing it uh, in the forties uh, and it used to be called an old man's disease. Uh, it's not. And people used to say, oh, don't worry about it. You're going to die of something else. It's not always the case. Um, I was uh, 55 when I was diagnosed. And so it, uh, it does come on fairly early. I've seen guys recently in their, their uh, upper thirties, 36, 38, uh, that are having to deal with it. Um, so it's, it's really age dependent and we, we don't know, we're sure it's probably from some sort of exposure, uh, is why the, the higher rates amongst veterans, there's a raging debate ongoing inside the, the community as to whether we screen more often or we screen veterans, uh, more effectively, or there's just more exposure. And I think maybe it's a combination of all three. Um, when we're now the society with COVID now is all starting to talk about testing and results and probabilities and statistics. And a lot of people don't go through the entire understanding of all those uh, epidemiology studies and why um, Congress has passed a couple of rules or a couple of um, suggestions recently. There's a study going on uh, that has been appropriated for um Military aviators, uh, both air crew and pilots and air crew, um, have a much higher propensity for prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a study now to look at why. And uh, some of us uh, have contributed some tissue and some blood and things like that to this study to, uh, to really figure out. There's some uh, experts at, at, up at Harvard at the Broad Institute and in, uh, at NASA, uh, Dr. Jeff Jones and others that think they can maybe figure out where it's coming from, whether it's radiation, UV radiation, you know, equipment, uh, stuff, uh, chemical, uh, from flight decks or flight line exposures, or, uh, the other they know is I think there's a theory and it's been fairly well proven that, um, high levels of adrenaline, uh, in your body basically, uh, can break down some of your, your DNA or make it mutate in certain ways. And it, they believe that part of that is maybe uh, affecting your prostate. Uh, so well, that, anyway. that's that's an interesting fact because you and I come from high adrenaline uh, um, uh, careers. Uh, in fact, when I retired, I realized I needed to do something to give me an <laughs> adrenaline rush. Which, but then eventually the body says no. Um, yeah, right. So when when I went to the prostate fair, uh, one of the things that was interesting um, was they sent a social worker in to talk to me and. You know, they ask questions like, do you have somebody to talk to? And I said, uh, well, I'm a late in life Catholic and I've got a priest who's my spiritual advisor and I talk to him often. And the um, counselor went, OK, you're the social worker went, OK, you're good. Signed off my checklist and walked around. So uh, it was interesting that if you're a man of uh, practicing faith, you don't need a social worker. But the yeah. um, what they offered 
uh, was standard radiation, you know, go in for eight weeks, that's 40 sessions of radiation. And so yeah. think about that. That's eight weeks. And I guess if you miss a session, now you have to uh, reset. Um, and so there's side effects with every um, procedure. And then they talked about uh, the seeds, implanting seeds in your prostate. And they said they're yeah, the, the brachytherapy. Si- yeah. Yeah. They said it's uh, the size, the nuclear seeds that are the size of a grain of rice and they put 75 to a hundred in your prostate. And I went, how the hell do they do that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at which point my wife said, how do you, how do you do that? And when he explained how they did that, uh, he also said, we can do it with the local and uh, while you're awake, but if you're a chatter, we're going to put you to sleep. And he went, Admiral, uh, you're definitely a talker. We're going to put you <laughs> to, to sleep. And when they explained how they did it, my wife said, if he goes that route, will you please take a picture of the process uh, for me? <laughs> oh, so yeah, we, we, I guess we, we'll just, we both of us will laugh. Anybody that needs to um, know how they actually put those seeds in there, you know, send me a, an email. And then uh, surgery. And they, when yeah. they described the surgery, you know, um, I don't know if we should describe the surgery, but it's basically robotic. Uh, one person at the bedside, one person on the controls, and they snip above your prostate, below your prostate, try and save your um, nerve endings that are attached to the prostate, and then pull it out and uh, put a catheter in there. And, you know, um, again, we're not giving medical advice, but my buddies that have had the surgery are now having follow on surgeries, not for prostate cancer, but for um, the issues with the surgery but the interesting no it's i mean we should just tell them it's either there's a high probability of erectile dysfunction or uh urinary incontinence issues and it's um that's been one where they they do try to tell you that it's um and i'm not trying to do again not give health advice or not to give uh health care advice but um there's a, there's a lot of things, and this is what led me to my choice for CyberKnife. I mean, I'll be honest with you, and that's why I, I took it as precision, because I first go around, I wanted to, um, I felt that, uh, you know, this is a disease that you just can't, it's not going to go away, right? I mean, even if it's cured, you still have to manage it. You still have to watch. Uh, and so, you know, or they call it cured. I think you still need to be aware of it the rest of your life. And I... Uh, I felt that um, while, look, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm more of an engineer and I was looking at, uh, at the precision that uh, CyberKnife provided. I, I uh, reached out to uh, family members that, that uh, knew about it and Sandy Vermeulen and Bob Meyer up in Seattle, uh, were some of the pioneers in CyberKnife. And, and what it is, is might as well tell them it's a high intensity radiation device. Um, you go in instead of the 30 uh, or 40 uh, rounds of radiation, um, you go through five. Uh, some guys actually, uh, Don Fuller here in San Diego is, uh, is only doing four now. So um, there's a theory, I think there's a study going on that uh, the more radiation you can provide in the lower uh, fractions or the lower number of times, the better outcome that you're getting. Um, but it's, it's incredibly accurate, sub millimeter accuracy, three dimensional, uh, device that rotates. It's a, it looks like, uh, the Toyota manufacturing line, right. you know, robot that flies around you and, um, and, and drives those, uh, you know, radiation beams through your prostate and they can plan. It takes a day or so to plan a couple of days with uh, 3d planning tools to, uh, stay away from uh, or build margins around other tissues, whether that be your colon, your intestines, your stomach, your bones, your, your pelvic, uh, structure, that sort of thing to, to preserve those things. You know, you don't want, uh, you really don't want radiation going through all your bones. I mean, it's just not something that, uh, you know, we, as we get older, these are things we've got to look out for the, the, you know, breaking of hips or the brittle hips and that kind of thing. You just, you don't want that. So, it was one of the ones I, I, I too had, had done that. And I, I felt I was, I'm still a big proponent of the technology. And, um, uh, I wrote an article about it and I did publish it, uh, hopefully for, you know, for the benefit of, uh, of our classmates and, uh, and, and alumni. And, um, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, I don't know. I think you told me that you saw it or actually, I think your wife saw it, uh, and, uh, got a wonderful call from you guys. And, uh, so that, that was our story, how we met. Yeah, and uh, so I did elect to it, uh, get CyberKnife, and it was I was referred out to Georgetown uh, 
Bedstar Hospital there in Georgetown, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, with Dr. Sean Collins. And the technician said, uh, Dr. Collins doesn't want to waste any um, radiation, so he's very uh, precise uh, in it. And uh, um, they do put some protection around other organs. Uh, and they also, that process includes um, inserting some gold markers in your uh, prostate. And that's done. They knock you out. You're done in uh, yeah. 10 minutes. Um, but that's how they can do the uh, 3D mapping. But the interesting thing uh, that I found is, you know, our fathers, you know, if a priest said something, it was a word of God, you know, let's follow it. If a doctor said something, it was word of God and let's uh, follow yeah. it. You know, our fathers, they would have said, you have prostate cancer, we're going to cut it out tomorrow. And they'd go, okay. But what I've uh, realized is no doctor would recommend anything. They would tell you uh, what they can do and you had to make the, the decision. And I, I thought that's an interesting process that you have to really get involved in your treatment. Now, every treatment does have side effects, and uh, the other one is uh, watchful waiting, and that means I think you have to get a, a biopsy every six months or so, or, you know. Uh, in, you know. Well, it's, it's active surveillance uh, is actually the, the, the term they're using, and I, I challenge guys that um, if they go on active surveillance for the low uh, low PSAs, and, and PSAs below six or below four, they think it's low, um, I, I try to recommend that when they say active surveillance, it's the first word that's really key. It's active surveillance. It's not just surveillance. It's not taking this thing. Uh, I mean, it needs to be understood that, that that means you are integral. You need to have a communication line with your physician and you need to watch what's going on because once it's there and once your PSA is rising, um, there's there's really not a magic bullet you know you're not you can't eat enough pears or apricots or whatever to make it go down it is there and you're going to have to watch it and at some point um you know it's up to you and your your physician to make that decision when you want to take action on it uh my that's what i think the beauty of these new technologies like um um uh, you know the the cyber knife and uh, and I I'm going to tell you about my recurrence in just a second. I've I've actually had a recurrence, um, and it's uh, you know and we knew that it was a, my cyber knife was a bit questionable when I did it, but we I had a recurrence and I just went through a new technology called a laser ablation, which is actually a, they say uh, and I guess they they've proven it to me is a little more accurate than even the cyber knife. So um, uh, same, same kind of device or not a device. It, it's, a, it's actually kind of very manual where they insert a laser in a uh, very small probe and they literally touch the tissue that is been predetermined to be cancerous. So if it's your prostate that they're going to treat on a, on a nouveau treatment where you're just discovered, they'll take out the entire prostate that way. And it's literally ablating, or in other words, burning it, or, or from a laser's perspective, just dispensing with the tissue. Uh, mine was a recurrence that they found through another big technology for that's uh, not really available in the U.S. right now called a PSMA, a prostate-specific um, what is it? Uh, membrane uh, assessment or uh, assay, prostate-specific membrane assay, so PSMA, and that is a uh, it's a PET scan, but it's uh, they inject you with some nuclear medicine before you go through the PET scan, and it will light up. It's a real rapidly uh, attracted to any tissue or any uh, any residual chemicals or, or, or sorry, any membrane that has prostate cancer in it in your body anywhere. And then they take a full PET scan picture of you. And in mine, the last one, they they found three uh, lymph nodes and. Um, the only where only place that uh, is actively really pursuing that uh, that clinical study right now or in trial is at the West Los Angeles VA. Oh wow! Uh, so it's um, and it's as we talk about these things, the you know we're promoting now. This is one of the things that the VA does do a lot of research, and it's uh, they've got some some incredible physicians, incredible researchers, and. Uh, so West LA VA is doing this. Uh, it's free of charge. Um, they'll take any vet right now with any uh, level of prostate cancer. 
And so uh, recurrent, uh, Nuvo, stage one, two, three, four, doesn't matter. Uh, they will take you and they will scan you uh, with this uh, with this technology. And um, I think it's it's actually changing the way we manage our cancer. And this is something that wasn't available five years ago. You and I have, didn't have this choice. Right, right. I mean, it's amazing how much uh, technology has changed just in the past four or five years since we've been yeah. dealing with this. Now, uh, I want to say that the, the cyber knife that I had was five sessions, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one week, Tuesday, Thursday. The next week, you lie down on a, a mechanical platform that's going to line your body uh, in the dim the lights and they turn on the music and you can doze <laughs> off and 40 minutes later uh, you're done and uh, back to work. Now it does yeah. have some side effects. And I was talking to another admiral who's chosen active surveillance. Uh, I need to catch up with him, but he said any side effects. And I go, I I did have one side effect. And uh, um, that is for the first time in my life, I actually had a bowel movement in a Walmart and uh yeah and, and admiral stanley said in your pants i said no i made it to the the bathroom but later dr collins explained that yeah the uh shortly after uh radiation treatment it's taken some of the elasticity out of your uh rectum which i learned more about uh, a rectum and that you eat one fork fork more than you should and your body's going to say three two yeah. one go to the bathroom. We're done. Yeah, we're, right. we're done. Yeah, There's done. no, yeah, no yeah. control. So that's, <laughs> and I yeah. share these things because men need to see the humor aspect as well. And I think if you go through uh, this with a positive attitude, uh, uh, you're going to be absolutely uh, fine. Um, before we start a little bit of your, um, what you've done in leading through prostate cancer, anything else we want to mention about uh, men, you know, ask if they're, you know, Track your set a baseline, track your PSA, ask your doctor, and the doctors are going to make you make a decision should you be yeah. um, diagnosed. Yeah, it's, you know, it's something that, uh, that we're promoting right now is uh, from a, a veteran's perspective, because I'm sort of focused on our own organization, the you know, Veteran Prostate Cancer Awareness, is that uh, we really feel that that, that population, and we're, we're pushing for this to be categorized as a high-risk population, just because of the exposures that we've all had in our careers and in our jobs. Nobody, we, we don't know. That's the thing. It's the unknown. But it doesn't hurt to start getting your blood test or get a, um, ask for a blood test at around the age of 40 and then have an annual screen. Just all it is is a simple blood test. The DRE, uh, if, if there's any indication, and there's a lot of, symptoms that that go unnoticed it's one of they call it a silent disease for a lot of reasons and the the symptoms that people don't you know kind of compare or don't uh, uh, associate with prostate cancer are things like urgency to uh, urinate and it's not just that you drink too much coffee or you're getting old you, that shouldn't happen you you should be able to hold yourself um you know, erectile dysfunction that can can be associated with it. So again, if you're getting old, it's not a uh, it's not an excuse. It's uh, you, you need to tell your doctor about it and have that discussion. Don't be embarrassed. It's part of your body. It's, you know, it says uh, you know, ask your doctor about it. Whether you've got a weak heart or a you know weak erection, you need to ask your doctor about why it's going on. There's tests they can run to make sure that you're okay. Um, part of this is, is making sure that your prostate's not uh, blown up. on, Right. And so, you know, it's, again, it's really just like, like you, you're promoting and thank you for doing so is that, you know, it's awareness. It's, it's understanding we're men. We have egos that keeps us away from the doctor, but you know, let's go, let's just go to the doctor once a year and, and get it, made, get it done. Right. So it's, uh, it's not that hard. And I, you know, the, the other is we formed this organization. Uh, our, our mission is to really to to just raise awareness and to help educate. And uh, really, that's the the goal is uh, not not to try to change somebody's mind because that decision is between themselves, their family, uh, and their doctor. And I we we do promote though that this is a this isn't a man's disease. Uh, it's a relationship disease, and uh, we we use that line because. Uh, as you well know, and uh, as I do uh, from firsthand, um, you know, your wife was probably in the room when they told you you had cancer. Yes. And 
that that effect immediately changes what's going on in your relationship. It changes uh, your concern for her, her concern for you. She's now instantly thrown into what they would call a caregiver situation. She didn't sign up for that. Um, and it's your responsibility. I tell people that it, that your health is your mission. Right? It's not somebody else's. It's not the doctor's responsibility, and it's not your wife's responsibility. It's you you have to take responsibility uh, for your health. And so when they say you've got cancer, if it's you know if you catch it early, like you mentioned, it's the, it's curable, it's treatable, and it's curable. Um, yeah, you join the ranks uh, of an elite association, but it's uh, you uh, it, it's curable and it's and it's manageable, and that's really the message we, we we need to get out there. We need to try to promote, and um, you know that that's just it, it's just been too long. I mean, if you tell if you told a woman that uh, you know not to get a breast cancer or not to get a mammogram or she just ignore it, don't do it, they would the world would turn upside down, right? Right. Um, we need to have the same approach. We need to have the same approach that women have towards breast cancer. And, uh, there, you know, we're finding out a lot of ties between the two anyway, right now. Yeah. The point you brought out, I think is, uh, as I said, when you get cancer, the, it's, the family gets cancer because your kids are worried mm-hmm. about you. Your uh, spouse is worried about you. And again, I think what kills men is fear and embarrassment and, you know, a colonoscopy is a piece of cake, a PSA, a DRE. They're so simple, uh, yeah. you know, to, to monitor your health, set the baselines and follow through. Well, uh, I think we've given enough information about um, the disease, the treatment. Uh, yeah. I think we've covered all the treatment options. Um, uh, you know, um, Dr. Collins and I both are heavy set men, and he said, you know, uh, we lose weight, um, our, our manhood will work better. And he goes, and if you use it more <laughs> often, you, he said in front of my wife, and if you use it more often, it will work better. And she looked at him and she said, okay, doctor, I'll take a hit on that one. <laughs> so he later said, I wish my wife was as uh, funny and uh, caring as your wife. So, uh, you know, this is about leadership. You and I went to the Naval Academy. I call that a leadership um, uh you know, laboratory. Um, but yeah, when we were back, when we were wearing flight suits, we needed more beer, more flight time. Now that we're out of flight suits, we need more fiber and more bandwidth. And uh, <laughs> we we have a policy amongst my buddies that when we get together, we can only talk about our health for 15 minutes uh, collectively and only five minutes on the prostate. But so you, you, you are a, a fighter pilot extraordinaire. You are a leader. Tell tell me what you're, you've done your org, tell us about your organization, what you did with the VA, and a little bit about Zero. Sure. We um, when I went through my uh, my first treatment sessions with uh, with the VA in Phoenix, and at that time when I stepped out to go get treated up at Swedish Hospital in Seattle, I, I really took a, a look around the VA. Um, I was traveling extensively at the time, and I, and I. Um, I'd always volunteered at the VA just because I wanted to be engaged. It was sort of my philanthropic uh, give back. And I, I loved helping the, the World War II vets and the Vietnam guys. Uh, and it was just something that I wanted to give back and stay involved with. And um, what I started to notice is that uh, there was no educational materials. There was nowhere to find any information. I looked on the website, and this was 2017, early 17. The last updated web page on prostates on the VA website was 2013. And um, so I, I, I sat down and uh, with some good friends and, and physicians, we said, listen, why don't you start a nonprofit and, and let's just raise awareness. Let's just try to put something out there and, and uh, you know, at least have a cause and, and, and put it together. And I, I'd gone to a zero summit and uh, we'll talk about zero, the end of prostate cancer in a second, but they, so I did, I formed veterans. Uh, prostate cancer awareness, which is a 501c3, um, got it through. We, we've uh, had a lot of good sponsorship and a lot of you know great effects, great support from uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, even the Chicago Bears have uh, have helped us out. Um, too bad we don't have any spare quarterbacks for them. Uh, but we, uh, you know, the, 
they've helped us out. A lot of guys are, are starting to pitch in and, and call in. And uh, uh, then uh, I had ended up with this recurrence issue. So we kind of took a hit from the, the active leadership perspective. I mean, I just, I just didn't have time. And so zero came to me and said, Hey, come and join with us. Let's partner. Let's get the firms to partner together. Zero, the end of prostate cancer. It's the nation's largest patient advocacy organization for, for prostate cancer. Um, they've been around about 20 years, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of races, thousands of, of members, all 50 states are covered. And they said, let's, let's form a, a veterans line within zero and you can manage it. We'll help you. We'll give you all of our resources. They're all approved by the American Cancer Society, the NCCN, uh, American, uh, American Neurological Association. Everybody's signed off on all of the literature that comes out. So there's a great group of standards that, that deal with anything that comes on uh, Zero's website or its social media pages. They also have developed, um, uh, I guess, programs to actually offer services to uh, survivors and the caregivers. So they have a mentor program. They have what's called Zero Three Sixty, which is a, a call in, a dial in line, twenty four seven. You, if you've got a problem with anything related to prostate, you can dial that phone number and you can get in there. And you can find that number at zerocancer.org, and it's uh, it's really easy. It's just zerocancer.org. You go in, you can register for the run walks, you can register to donate, you can do your research, uh, all of the, the guides and any of the information and material that's on that website is essentially, you can consider it approved. I mean, it, it is a good for prostate cancer. It's a spot to go to. There's a couple others, uh, uh PRF.org prostate cancer research foundation, uh, is one and PCRI.org, uh, the prostate cancer research Institute. Uh, those really are the, to me, the three big ones to go to. And that's why we elected because, uh, to go with zero because they're patient oriented. And we were, we were looking out to be patients. And I've, we've now pulled together, uh, with zero's help, uh, veteran packages, veteran specific packages that we will give out to, uh, vets. We're trying to get, uh, organizations like the VFW, American Legion, Wounded Warriors, all of the, the various, uh, veteran service organizations, uh, to pitch in. Um, one is, uh, the reason why is that prostate cancer is the number one detected or diagnosed cancer inside the VA. Uh, it has been for years, still is today. Uh, there's over, um, 14,000 men diagnosed every year that are just veterans in the VA system. Uh, we have currently, uh, over half a million guys that are actively being treated for prostate cancer in the VA system. And of those, there's over 16,000 metastatic cases. Now, that's, uh, that, that's a big, those are, get to be big numbers, right? right. And, and that's from a study that was done last year. It's ended uh, one year ago right now uh, called the, the Vinci. Uh, it's, it's got a long acronym, but it's a core data study done by some scientists inside the VA. And um, they picked prostate cancer as the disease to, to study with their uh, artificial intelligence and, and learning system. And they've been a little bit surprised at the numbers that they got out of that. But uh, to have a patient database of a half a million guys with prostate cancer, you know, that's not all of vets because only 9 million veterans out of 18 or 19 million are even being seen in the VA. Right. So, so uh, but out of those 9 million, those are the numbers. And that that's a big issue. That's why we then turned to Capitol Hill and started to push on uh, some legislation to standardize the treatment, standardize the process, get these physicians or get the doctors, the resources that they need to treat this disease and to, to raise some awareness to really, because again, it is, it is treatable. The, here's the other sad facts are that there's only 47 radiation devices, even in uh, the VA system. And only three of those are cyber knives. And um, up until two years ago, they weren't even treating prostates. Uh, they'd, they'd just come online. Those three cyber knives have come online within the last three years. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a device that's been essentially sanctioned by the VA, but it wasn't being used for uh, prostate cancer. It's typically used for head and neck and uh, spinal type cancers and that sort of thing, but right. uh, not for prostate. Now, 
you know, so so the primary mode of treatment in the VA is uh, is that surgery that you talked about, the uh, radical prostatectomy or robotic prostatectomy. And um, you know, it's a the the Mission Act was passed in 2018 while you were on the on staff, and uh, you know, hats off to the administration at that point because it's been a game changer. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of it. They've done a horrible job of marketing and promoting that. Right. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a great program took over for the choice program and it, um, but what people don't realize is it appropriated a hundred billion dollars over a six year period of time for VA, for veterans outside care in the community. And that program is, it's paying for my care right now in my recurrent. Uh, they didn't have certain expertise in the VAs to take care of my certain conditions. So it's, really paying for my my care i'm i'm alive because of it so i mean it's uh my hat's off to the whole thing and it's uh it's a great it's a great way if you know how to navigate it and we're trying to teach vets how to navigate it and to teach the administrators and and also the physicians why that why it's important for them to use it so it's um that that's our organization and we we those are some of the goals and and things we're trying to take on I needed extra hands. And so that's why we partnered with zero, the end of prostate cancer. And, um, so we're, we're starting a campaign. Uh, we started it on veterans day. We're recruiting 50 vets in 50 States. Uh, and the mission for those vets is to interface with your local VA. Uh, pretty easy. We, we supply all the materials, essentially handing out uh, information cards and flyers and uh, t-shirts to guys that are prostate cancer survivors. Uh, go into the infusion rooms, drop off uh, qualified information, work with the PAO at the VA, the local VA, uh, on any run walks that would be taking place, any other events that we might be having. But really, it's just uh, it's an ambassador from uh, zero, the end of prostate cancer, to the VA system and to offer them no charge, no fee, no nothing, just offer them materials and ed- and, and qualified educational uh, type of, uh, materials and, and information. So that's really the goal of that program. And, uh, I think we're up to about 12 already. So, um, you know, I've been, uh, volunteering some of my friends and classmates. So. Good, you know. good, good. <laughs> uh, well, you know, when you think about how the technology has changed just in the three or four years that uh, we've been diagnosed or five years, um, and how much the, you know, I, th- I used to say the VA handled uh, prostate cancer. They waited until you got old and they removed it with a dull deer antler. Um, you know, now that they have three cyber knife uh, machines, that's, uh, that's amazing. So, yeah, um, yeah. you know, we've come a long way. Uh, again, we're not here to offer, uh, medical advice, but to, uh, make you think about, uh, a men's health, uh, whether it be prostate cancer or getting a colonoscopy PSA. Um, also, uh, Mike, you know, I reflect back on our Naval Academy uh, years, and we never thought we were going to lose a, a, a football game until the final uh, bell. And I think that's, you know, the don't give up the ship. It sounds corny, but, uh, and then when we've been deployed at sea, we have to solve problems. And you're a, a number one example of getting a cancer and saying, no, this is not over. You know, I'm not going to stand on the steps of Capitol Hill or something in with tears in your eyes say, I have prostate cancer. You know, hey, I've got prostate cancer. We're going to kick ass. We're going to take names. We're going to carry out the plan of the day. We're going to kill this sucker. And you have done that. And there's no way to find out how many veterans that you are helping. You know, there's just no way. But uh, um, you definitely, through your leadership, uh, you are saving lives uh, through awareness of prostate cancer. And again, this is Movember, Mustache November for uh, men's health. And so uh, we want to tell men, don't be afraid, you know, uh, have a positive attitude, have faith, uh, prostate cancer can be cured. Uh, But the first step, uh, wives, if you're listening or uh, significant others, make your man go in, see the doctor and have uh, the conversation about these issues, about setting a baseline. Yeah, get screened. I mean, that's a that's the bottom line. It's like, uh, you know, like Nike used to use as the tagline, just do it. Uh, that's it. It's just do it. Just go get screened. It's just not that hard. I mean, it's to start with a blood test, DRE. There's a great, there's a, uh, if you remember the guy, uh, Mike Rowe, he's a, you know, the, the uh, dirty jobs guy, yeah. right? 
Yep. So he, he did a public service announcement that you can find on YouTube. It was done for zero, the end of prostate cancer. And it's on our website as well. But uh, not only is it humorous, it shows how easy this is. And uh, he actually does his DRE uh, during the public service announcement. <laughs> we don't stop till you say, we go. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, and it's, that's it. Uh, it's uh, and it's a great um demonstration of how easy this is and it uh you know that that two or three seconds can save your life and it it really is it's that simple it's a blood test two or three seconds and then most importantly is that conversation about risk stratification and risk analysis with your doctor i mean you've got to open your lips and talk about things You, you can't uh it if the doctor doesn't know he can't give you a recommendation right and it's um there's nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing to be worried about. And it's the, the more you put it off, the the higher the probability is that something's, you know, it's not going to be a good conversation. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it really is. I, I can't encourage guys enough to just go get screened. I mean, yeah. just ask your doctor about it. Yeah. If you're peeing in Morse code or, uh, you know, can't can't get an erection. You know, talk yeah. to your doctor. They they yeah. hear this all the time. Don't be uh, um, embarrassed. Um, yeah. So right. again, Mike, I want to thank you for coming down to the studio high atop the Biltmore Hotel in downtown New Braunfels, uh, Texas. I hope you enjoyed the gift basket uh, we put in your room. Um, you know, uh, if you're listening to this and you've gotten this far, hopefully you've learned something a little bit about uh, um, leading in the face of adversity. Uh, um, follow the Admiral's Almanac wherever you get your uh, podcast. So, uh, Mike, I know you uh, sent me an email requesting uh, my help in one area, and I'm glad to uh, help and be part of the working group. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time and uh, appreciate your concern uh, for all those vets and those sailors that uh, that that you led throughout your career. So um, thank you for your service and thank you for uh, what you're doing now. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be a part of this. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. I've stopped.